you so much for having me. Absolutely. Well, we like to start with the difficult questions here. What's your favorite ice cream? Anything chocolate. I'm not a huge ice cream person. I really do prefer cake or brownies, but if I had to pick an ice cream, it would be chocolate. Okay. Now you've taken on me on a totally different route than I typically go because you brought up brownies. Big fan of brownies over here as well. But there's a specific part of the brownie that is by far the best part of a brownie. I'm curious, are you a round center person or the edge kind of person? I like the center. It's much more soft. So that's definitely me. Okay. Well, that was the wrong answer because clearly everybody loves the edge. <laughs> no, I'm a big fan of the edges. Um, I, I saw this pan one time that was just the edges and I'm like, that's what I want for Christmas just so I can have the edge pieces. All right. Awesome. Well, tell our listeners, what's the scoop? What do you do today? Yeah, today I teach people about money. Specifically, we talk about tax lien investing as a different avenue and part of your real estate portfolio. Awesome. And take us back. Where'd your real estate journey begin? Yeah. So I grew up in poverty. Um, I definitely didn't have any real estate experience getting into college, but kind of looked around and noticed that some of my friends had nice big houses and I was always interested in the real estate aspect. And it wasn't until I was working as a bank teller that this lady walked in with this check she was depositing and it was like $50,000. And I was making minimum wage at the time. So I had to ask her, I'm like, what do you do? She's like, oh, honey, I'm a real estate agent. And I thought, all right, I need to be one of those. And so that kind of opened my eyes to what a real estate agent could make. Um, so I got my license right before the crash. So I was licensed in 2006 here in Florida and went through some very hard times. But I really feel like when you go through hard times, you learn how to grow a business the right way because it's not good times, right? Um, so I love numbers. I've always been a numbers person. So I work really well with investors and that's kind of where I found my niche at that time because you could buy a $50,000 house and rent it for $1,000 a month. And those were incredible returns during that time. So I really focused on one area and really learned what an investment would look like for somebody. And then also started investing in single family properties myself. Gotcha. Were your single family properties, were those in the Florida area? Yeah, I was living in Tampa at the time. So we were scooping up like $50,000, $60,000, $70,000 homes and just renting them out. And I thought, this is what I'm going to do forever, right? We're going to have long-term rentals. I'm going to have tenants. And I thought, this is the way that you build wealth. Well, I didn't really enjoy being a landlord. And every time I would hire a property management company, I just felt like they weren't doing a good enough job. You know, I'm, I'm huge about service and I don't want my tenants to feel like they're just another number because then it hurts my reputation too. So I had to figure out there's got to be a different way than owning a single family property, getting calls on Christmas about toilets or not liking the property manager and then them finding my phone number anyways. So I was like, what else can I learn that's still in real estate? Cause I love it, but not owning a property as a single family owner. Yeah. Take us back to 2008, if you could, because um, that was obviously a very interesting time, especially if you were just getting into real estate. And a lot of folks today like to look at today's time and say, are we on the verge of a 2008 in terms of what's going on in the real estate market? So I, I tend to think not, but I would love to hear like, what's your perspective of what it was like in 2008 to be a real estate investor? Yeah. Um, 2008 was much different. It wasn't a housing market crash. It was a debt market crash. That meant that the banks were giving loans to people who really didn't qualify. They weren't verifying the income, the paperwork, any of that. You could just go get a loan with no documents and say, I make $200,000 a year and I could go do it five times with five different banks and get loans. That got people in trouble. So I definitely don't think we're in the same market as far as residential is concerned. Now, if we want to switch topics to syndications, apartment complexes and commercial loans, we might be in a little bit of a trouble with that for the next year. But I don't think we'll see the same housing market crisis we did with single family homes today, even with the higher interest rates. It just means that, you know, you you it's always a good time to buy if it's right for you in that moment. And you've got to really think about that if you're buying a house. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think uh, to on top of the debt piece, it's about supply and demand. And one of the things we saw leading up into the GFC was so much supply coming in on market, specifically in places like Florida, Las Vegas, where they were kind of uh, second homes or touristy homes at that time. Today, it's obviously changed tremendously in both of those markets. But I think uh, one of the things that I've really learned over the past couple of years comparing 
this time to 2008 is supply really matters. And if I were looking to invest, I would be looking at areas where there's not a lot of building going on. Any uh, commentary on that or anything you would add there? Yeah. And then, and like, so for example, if we focus on apartments right here in Miami, we may still have a great population growth, but there's probably 20 projects that are in some state of building with um, apartments here in Miami. So I think in the next year or so, we're going to start to have that supply issue because rents went really high. Every, everyone was moving to Florida, obviously post COVID. So builders were coming out and making these massive buildings, but now we're not seeing the same growth, but a lot more buildings are still being produced. So I think places like that, um, places like uh, North Carolina, I still see a lot of building in Denver, a lot of building in Phoenix. So there's going to be some pockets. Texas is probably another one. Austin's probably going to be in trouble when it comes to the apartment complexes. But paying attention to where the population is growing is really key because obviously, you know, supply and demand is very important. Um, so I don't necessarily focus on the syndication and apartment investing at this time because the market's so uncertain and interest rates are so high. But yeah, I definitely agree with you. You've got to pay attention to both the interest rates, the economic growth, the population, and how much supply is coming into the market to truly understand where the best opportunities are right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you led off your story with talking about single family, and then you decided to niche down. I'm assuming that was in tax liens uh, and tax deeds as well, or just tax liens? Yeah. So I'm a numbers person and I love to read. I came across this book called The 16% Solution. So if anyone's writing a book out there and you want to find the nerds, put a number on the front of it and we're going to pick that <laughs> book up. So I just happened to pick up this book because it said a 16% solution. I thought, where are they getting 16% returns passively, right? So I picked up the book and I really started to learn about tax lien investing. So spent quite a bit of time reading books, watching YouTube channels, talking to mentors that were already doing this. And about five or six years ago, I made my first tax lien purchase. Now I'm in Florida, it's a little bit different. So every county is different, every state is different. I focus in Florida because I live here and I could drive by the property and I focus on tax liens. So I'm gonna tell you what a tax lien is, right? If you own a home or a commercial building, but we'll focus on the home, you're paying property taxes. They're due every year and the government counts on that money because they've got a budget to pay. They've got teachers, they've got roads, they've got police officers, all of that is part of their budget. And as you as the homeowner, if you don't pay those taxes, they're gonna take that piece of paper, they're gonna put a lien on your property because you owe the taxes, and now they're gonna go sell that piece of paper to an investor. That's where I come in. Now, you know, there's so many different avenues you can do with tax liens, but it's a great way for you to get into the real estate investing space with like $500, right? You can buy a property tax lien as those $500 in Florida and at least get into the real estate game with a lot less money than going out and having to buy a single family property. Yeah. So tax lien, um, if I understand correctly, and I've never done any tax lien investing, but I know enough to sound really stupid um, and I'm, what I'm about to say, but a tax lien is you um, uh, have first right of refusal of the tax money, if if I'm understanding correctly. And you because of that, because you bought that lien, you get a percentage of uh, your investment back, whereas a tax deed, you're actually getting access to the property. Is that right? Could you help me Differentiate the between differences. The two? Yes. Please. Yeah. So the property owner still owns the property, but they have an IOU. They haven't paid their property taxes. So I'm coming in and I'm paying their taxes for them. Now I do get an interest rate and I know what the interest rate is going to be up front because I'm bidding on it. Right. So take, we're going to stay with Florida, for example. Florida will pay up to 18% interest on that tax lien to me just because they're borrowing money from me to pay their budget until that homeowner pays their taxes back. Now, it is an online auction system, which is a lot of fun and also nerve wracking at the same time, because when you bid on it, I can tell the government I need 18%, but say someone else wants to come in and buy that same piece of paper, that same tax lien, they can tell the government, well, I'll accept 16%. And of course, they're going to go and they're going to win because they're, well, they will take less on that interest. But what I love about it is, one, I have a piece of paper from the government saying that they're going to pay me back. And it is first position on the property. Two, I know exactly the interest rate I'm going to earn someday in the future. Now, it could be a year, it could be two years, could be three years, depending on the process of the state. But at least I know what I'm going to get at the end of the day. I don't know many other instruments besides maybe a bank CD 
where you know what kind of interest rate you're going to get. And none of those CDs are paying me 18%. Absolutely. You do. Do you do all of your tax lien investing in Florida? Yeah, I'm only in Florida because one of the things that I teach is I want to go drive by the property. I know it sounds really old school. Google Maps can be great for you to, as a starting point. But say, for example, there was a fire at that house and Google Maps showed the house before the fire. Well, if I have to foreclose on that property, I don't want to own dirt. I don't want to have a big project. Right. So in my buy box, I'm specifically looking for a house that still is there. And I drive by it to make sure that I'm buying a, a tax lien for a house instead of just vacant land. So I do Florida because I can easily drive to it. But you know, if you get into the tax lien investing game, you could of course cross states. Every county has a different law. And like you said, some states don't even sell that lien. They foreclose on the property and sell you the actual deed, which means you own that property. Gotcha. So you've bought your liens, um, you've driven past them, make sure there's actually a property there, not a burnt piece of dirt. Um, what is the process on the borrower paying you back then? Or the, uh, I guess, would it be the government the or the actual homeowner? Right. Yeah, the homeowner. And most times homeowners fall behind on their property taxes because they're in some type of financial duress, right? Maybe they lost their job, had a death in the family. Maybe there was a medical issue. So I'm specifically looking for tax liens on properties that are homestead. That means that's their primary home. They most likely live there and maybe they just had a financial event that keeps them from paying taxes at that moment. But when they do pay the taxes back to the county, they're paying them fees and that interest rate. And then that interest rate comes back to me along with my initial investment. So you get, you know, say you bought a tax lien for $1,000. I'm gonna get that plus my interest rate back once that property owner pays back their taxes to the, the county. Do they have a set number of uh, a set time? Because I know in certain states, it's like two years, 30 days, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, in Florida, um, it could be up to three years before the foreclosure process starts. So if they don't pay it, then a foreclosure process can start. I can foreclose on them because I own that tax lien. And if I do that and I go through the system and I win the, the, the um, the ability to take back that property, then unfortunately the homeowner has to leave the property and they lose the property, but it could be up to three years in Florida. Have you ever gone through that process? No. And, and it really is because I, I, I have my buy box and I'm very specific on what I look for. And I've been fortunate enough that all the property owners have paid back their taxes. You know, like for example, on an investment property, someone might just be walking away and just waiting for that foreclosure process. Um, I don't want to end up with the home at the end of the day because I truly want it to be as passive as possible. And tax lien investing allows for me not to manage a property. I don't deal with tenants. I don't have to worry about repairs. I'm just waiting to get my money back with the interest that I was promised up front. Gotcha. Gotcha. What is, what is your buy box? I'm curious and kind of going down this rabbit hole. Yeah. So um, I look for the midsize, the median size house, right? So I want to go where the most buyers are. So it depends on the county that I'm looking at but I'm looking for the average home price, I'm looking for a property that is homestead, that the owner lives in that property most likely because that's their primary residence. And I'm also looking um, in pub you know, public records in Florida is amazing because I can look to see if there's an actual loan on the property. So I do take that in consideration because even though I'm first in line, that loan has to be satisfied by the homeowner at some point in time, right? Not by me. I also stay away from anything that has an HOA because HOA fees plus attorney fees, no idea what that could look like for the homeowner later. So I just don't want to be in an HOA section either. So that's kind of what I look for as far as my buy box is. And another thing for the listeners too, is that you can buy tax liens in a retirement account. It's very similar. You can do a self-directed IRA and you can use that money to buy tax liens, which means the interest is going back into your retirement account and you're kind of deferring those taxes until you retire. So it's just another way for you to buy it if you don't have like cash in the bank right now, but you have a retirement account, you can also utilize that vehicle to buy tax liens as well. Yeah. And chances are, I'm not a CPA, you're not a CPA, but there's probably no depreciation that you can offset the, the uh, interest income that you're earning. So a, a qualified account in a self-directed IRA is probably a great vehicle to go do that in. Right. Because the, the interest that you earn is taxable at your current tax rate. So whatever 16, 18% interest I'm getting, it's going to be taxed as the same as anything else, ordinary income that I would. And yes, I'm not a CPA. So double check with your CPA. Yeah. So don't sue either of us. <laughs> um, 
I see the dollar bills behind you. And we were having a conversation beforehand of like teaching people about money and money is just a tool. I'm always interested when I meet folks like yourself who have a deep understanding of money and help others see that it is a tool, what their philosophy is or what their the way they explain money and understand money. Um, could you give us what is your understanding or your philosophy on money that you teach? Yeah. So, you know, there's a website called usdebtclock.org and it has real time. It shows what the student loan balances are in the U.S., what the credit card balances are in the U.S. We just surpassed $1.3 trillion in credit card debt. And that truly breaks my heart because this is something that's curable, right? It's not like some unknown disease where we don't have a vaccine. Money issues are curable. And a lot of times it's what we were taught at home. So I love talking about money. I love teaching people about budgeting, about creating extra income and helping them grow businesses. And so I love using the actual physical aspect of a dollar bill to show them like this is just a piece of paper. It's a tool that you're going to use in exchange for something else that has no emotion, doesn't care if you're man or woman, doesn't care what your upbringing is, if you're black, white, whatever, right? It's just a piece of paper. And so if we can take that emotion piece away from the money and teach you how to use it as a tool, just like anything else in your toolbox, then I really think that the credit card debt, especially is something that we can tackle, we can get rid of, we can get people out of debt because they, could, they feel so lost sometimes, right? And I just want to be able to teach them that there is a different way. They have to put in the effort, but money is just a tool. It's just a piece of paper. And you mentioned that um, most people's beliefs on money come from when they were younger, whether they were taught mm -hmm. consciously or self-consciously about that or subconsciously. What are some of those beliefs that you see about money? Yeah, I've seen it on both sides of the spectrum, right? So I came from poverty and it took me a long time before I could get out of this scarcity. Like I have to hold on to every penny. I can never invest. I'm going to lose money. You know, it's a very scary thing, right? But I've seen people who've grown up wealthy childhood and they think money's bad because people shame them. So it's really like, what were you taught? Think about some of the first things you learned about money. And even if you know that you were taught that and it's not your truth today, somewhere it's still in your brain. Somewhere it's going to be your first reaction. So you've got to be able to recognize that and change that story. Change that story about yourself. Change that story about what you believe in. And is that still true for you today? And when you become more conscious about it, then that's when the work can be done. But until you really realize what those early teachings were and what's still in your mind, then it's impossible for you to change it. You've got to become conscious about it first. And I will, I know for myself, I'm going to have to work on it every day for the rest of my life because it's just how my life started. But I understand it now and I can keep replacing that story for myself so that I'm not so scared about money anymore. And one of the things I see in relationships specifically is most uh, relationships end or divorce happens because of a money issue one way or the other. And usually it's the fact that they've never sat down and talked about their beliefs about money. So they have different views, spending habits, investing habits, and they never get to the root of the issue is you see money this way. I see money that way. Um, for somebody that might be listening, that's going through that with their spouse, partner, whatever that looks like in their life. How do we give them um, some tools or a table to sit at to have that conversation? What does that look like? Hey, fellow investors, before we dive into our next segment of the show, I wanted to take a quick moment to talk to you about a fantastic opportunity for you to invest with me. As you know, here at Ice Cream with Investors, I'm passionate about real estate investing and helping you navigate the exciting world of wealth creation through real estate. And that's why for the first time, I'm thrilled to tell you about an opportunity for you to invest alongside of me. Over the past three years, I've been investing in multifamily, mobile home parks, car washes. I've even become the bank and lent out money to fellow real estate investors on a short-term basis. And now you can come join me. If you'd like to jump on a call and learn more about this opportunity, head to icecreamwithinvestors.com slash invest and find a time for us to connect. And now back to the show. Yeah. So I, I have this discussion most times with women because in the relationship, um, most of the times that I have this conversation is because the man does take control of the finances, but the woman is willingly letting him do that. Right. Um, so I often paint the picture. If something happened to him tomorrow, if you don't know where your bank account, your credit cards, you don't know where your investments are and you weren't part of that plan, then you're going to feel lost. Not only did you have a loss of a person, but now you're completely lost in your finances. So sit down and have a conversation and say, if something were to happen to either one of us tomorrow, 
what would you want to see with our finances? And start there because when you have that emotional piece together and you get to plan it, that's when you can go backwards and build that foundation. Sometimes when you just try to jump in and say, oh, you spend too much money or where's our credit card statement, things like that, that can be a little heavy. But when you think about the end piece in mind and you have that emotional, and I'm hopefully talking about when you're in a good part of your relationship, start planning with that end piece and walk backwards to today. And that for me is the best way to build the foundation because it gives you a tie together. Like, oh, if this happened, here's where we wanna be. And then just be flexible with each other. You know, I have couples that have separate bank accounts for some spending, whether it's golf and wine or shopping. I'm a big shoe person. So, but it fits in my budget, right? These are the things that you, you go through and you talk about and have those conversations so that when it happens, it's not a surprise. It's something that you've already planned for. Um, the common pushback I commonly hear to something that uh, about what you just said, though, is, oh, well, Matt, Angela, you all are money nerds, like you're you're spreadsheet geeks, you're 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 numbers people like you have podcasts, you you study this stuff, you live this stuff. I just don't really care about it. Um, how do you round that circle with this conversation? Yeah, so I, I go worst case scenario a lot of times and have some fun with this. Like, oh, would you care if you're living in a cardboard box? Would you care if your kids couldn't go to school? Would you care if you don't have food tomorrow? And I really play with the emotional piece of it because I know that the money's tied somewhere in that emotional aspect of them. And so I'm trying to figure out where it's tied so that I can really dive into that piece. And then that kind of helps bring them around, right? And yes, I'm a numbers person. I'm very nerdy. I love spreadsheets, but I can also make it very visual and creative. And so like, what is getting out of debt look like for you? Who's there with you in that moment? What are you feeling? What can you do to celebrate? Who's celebrating with you? And I just keep going back to that emotional piece because I've got to figure out where in that emotional piece that they're struggling with and kind of blocking because that's why they're saying they don't care because there's something in there blocking them. So that that's where I'm looking to uncover. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I always try to approach that conversation too with, I didn't make the rules of life, but one of the rules of life is that you need money to survive and you need mm -hmm. money to live. Even in the poorest parts of the world, even the richest parts of the world, you need money to continue to live on this earth. So you might as well at least have a good understanding and a foundational understanding of how to use money as a tool to achieve mm -hmm. what you want um, for that reason only. And Sometimes it doesn't stick. So maybe I do need to go worst case and living in a cardboard box down by a river. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I tell you, when I was a kid, we, I lived in other people's houses. Um, I lived in a park. I lived in cars, motels, and it's the worst feeling. And as a kid, like, especially the parents out there, you don't, you don't understand the impact that they're it's having on them because they don't understand the why behind it. And they're going to bring it with them through the rest of their life unless they choose to, cha to change it as well. So you've got to imagine that impact on the kids when you do have kids involved. How, how old were you when you exited that part or that stage of your life? Uh, as soon as I could sign a lease on my own, 18 years old. Gotcha. So you kind of left that situation, decided you wanted to go on a different path? Yes, I knew that I wanted to study money. I just didn't know what that looked like. And I took five years to go to school because I paid for it on my own. I always had a job. So there were times when I had three jobs and I worked seven days a week. And it wasn't the smartest way, but it was the way in which I needed to move forward in order to learn what I needed to get to that next step. Yeah, sometimes the smartest way is not the fastest way. Um, mm -hmm. I would argue that when you get going, you can optimize, but sometimes you just have to get going. And if it's working three jobs so that you can have enough money to start off on a new venture and on a new route, that, that sometimes is the smartest way, I guess. Yeah, I love that. Especially when I talk to people about getting out of debt, I tell them, what's one thing you can do today? Just one. Put that into action, make it a habit, and then work on two. Like you, you can't do it all in one day. So if you can just do that one baby step to start and get some momentum, you'll be amazed in what you can accomplish in a year. Yeah. After working with hundreds, if not thousands of people on their money journey, what kind of rules of thumb do you uh, give as guiding post for folks on how they should be um, leveraging money in their personal economy, whether it's spending, uh, investing, saving, all that? And then if you could, I would love to hear your perspective on any kind of tools that you have that help people um, really take account for the income coming in and the expenses going out and preparing themselves. 
Yeah, it depends on the personality. If I think that they like to visually look at stuff, there's plenty of apps, you know. Uh, Rocket Money is a great app. I know Dave Ramsey has an app if you want to track your income and expenses and visually look at it, right? Uh, I am a paper person, so I will sit down with a client, we'll grab like a big, huge whiteboard, and we'll just draw out some future plans. And I tell them like, this is just us downloading. It doesn't happen right now. It might not happen a year, but just download. And we're going to put this up in your house so it's very visual. So I like the visual aspect of it. If I'm working with someone who's in, who's in credit card debt, we print out your credit card statements. I'm going to sit there and I'm going to look at them with you. And we're going to determine what can we cut out right now. And then I write the total year of savings of that thing that we're cutting out up on their visual board so that they can see the impact it's going to make on their lives. Um, so, so those are some of the things that I like to do. I'm a very hands-on person. If they're not as much visual but more emotional, then I want them to pair with somebody, someone who's going to cheerlead them and support them as they go up you know, and have downs in this journey. It could be me. It could be a friend. It could be just a mentor in their company, you know? If they're more emotional, I know that they need that person supporting them and that accountability from a person, then we'll go that route. So it's, un, it's you know, figuring out what kind of person they are and then kind of designing that tool around how they're going to react and best support them. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned the visual piece. When I was first getting on my money journey, I um, signed up for Personal Capital, now called Empower. And the idea, I would log into it every single day, even if I knew I didn't expend any money that day or I didn't have any money coming in. It was just it's an idea of seeing what money was coming in, tagging your expenses to what category they were coming in going out and then seeing your net worth is almost like a scoreboard that you could um, see up there and the clock ticking and, and trying to achieve a certain goal that really helped put it top of mind to me. So I wouldn't mm -hmm. say it was life changing other than it just got me more cognitive about the things that I was doing and how I was using money that day. Yep. And then every day that you're spending money, you're starting to think about it a little bit more because you know it's going to go into that and you're going to see it anyway. So then when you're at that store, you're like, wait, do I really need this extra thing? And even today, right, it's so easy for us to subscribe to anything, right? We've got an iPhone, it's got all these apps, you buy it for a year, and then it automatically renews. There's apps out there that will help you cancel those subscriptions for you. So you don't even have to sit on the phone for a half an hour to, you know, um, cancel something that you no longer need today. And just being able and cognizant, like you said, about those apps that are out there that really help you on this financial goal journey, but you just don't know what you don't know until you get with a mentor or a coach and they can help you along with this journey. Yeah, it will absolutely show you the subscriptions that are leaking out of your personal economy that you subscribe for that are probably like $1.99 a month that you didn't even realize. And obviously that's not going to make you rich, but it does put in the good habit of controlling what you're spending money on and knowing what you're spending money on. Right. It just takes $27.40 a day to hit $10,000 in a year. So 10,000 might seem like a lot for a savings account if you're trying to build up, but if you can put money in it and save money at the same time, you know, that's just a win-win for me. Yeah. Did you just do that off the top of your head? No, I posted it this morning <laughs> on Facebook, so I just remembered it. <laughs> it's a good little stat. Good little stat. Well, Angela, fantastic conversation. I want to switch us now to our, our last round. We're calling this the four toppings. Our first one is what is your favorite book or what is a book you've read recently that's given you a paradigm shift? Ha. Huh. So I read a lot of money books. And most times when I read a money book, I don't really learn a whole lot. But Candy Valentino has this book called Wealthy Habits. And I loved it because it broke it down by category and gave you step by step on what to do. Now, I love that. You know, I'm, I'm not a big like go and need positivity. I, I need you to tell me what to do. And so that book for me was incredible because it really teaches people step by step what to do. I don't think I've ever heard that one. So that's, uh, that's one I'll have to go check out. Our second one is, what is the best piece of advice you've ever received? Baby steps. I am all about taking big goals and breaking it down into small, small steps because then it seems manageable and you're more likely to do it. You're more likely to stick to it when it doesn't seem so overwhelming. Yeah. And then you get that dopamine hit, the endorphins that rush that make you want to do that next step that keep the ball rolling. And momentum is a powerful, powerful thing to stop. Yes. Our third one is what are you most proud of in your life? Huh. I feel like I've been knocked down a lot, especially this past five years. I went through divorce. I had a bad investment, lost over six figures that 
but I just keep getting back up. Like, I know that this is not the end of me. It's not the end of my story. I'm a Christian. I know that God's got a plan for me and I trust him and his plan. And so I really think that even though I get knocked down, I tell my story about getting knocked down because it's, it feels less heavy for me. But I need people to know that when you make mistakes, even myself that's been in real estate for 20 years, I still make mistakes, but I get back up and I don't let that stop me. We're going to nerd out after this on resiliency because I mentioned we have two kids and one of the things that I, I just want them to be resilient kids because I can't protect you from everything, from falling down and scraping and getting a boo-boo. I can't protect from bad things happening. You just have to be resilient to get back up and stay in the fight. Right. Our fourth and final one is if you could sit down and eat a bowl of ice cream with anyone, dead or alive, who would it be and why? Ah, definitely Tony Robbins. I've been listening to Tony Robbins on tape for a long time. And mindset is such a difficult thing for me. And I think a lot of other people struggle with that too. Maybe not just around money, but relationships, confidence, business. And I love his approach because when I hear him speak and I really think about what he's saying and I put it to use, it helps me shift my mind. And I think a mind can be such a powerful tool when used correctly, but it also can be a downturn for people. So Tony Robbins all day long. Okay. I know he's a little Ray raw and foo-foo for some people, but it's impossible to listen to Tony Robbins for 10 minutes and not come back out of that inspired or wanting to act or wanting to move. It's just impossible. I don't believe it. Mm -hmm. Yes, agree 100%. Well, Angela, fantastic conversation. If our listeners wanted to reach out to you, learn more about you or the um, stuff that you've got going on, where is the best place we can point them? Yeah, empowerhermoney.com. Also on Instagram, empowerhermoney. And if you text the word quiz, I have a quiz that helps you decide what kind of investor you are. And it's just a lot of fun to play with. Awesome. We will link those in the show notes. And then Angela, thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Empower Her Money podcast. I am grateful for you. Please make sure to leave us a five-star review, like this podcast, share it, subscribe, and let's keep teaching others how to take control and be empowered with their finances.